And I'm really excited because our next artist, she's been a longtime supporter of our radio show. She's a dynamic artist. She's a guitar player, a singer, a band leader. She's a mom to a great family of her husband and her kids who also play in her band. She's originally, I don't know originally, but she spent a lot of time in North Philly, now making her home in Delaware. You're going to love hearing from Culture Music and our next guest, Samantha Ghetto Songbird Hollins. Welcome to Musicians Reveal. Thank you for having me. Hello. Yeah, you, you, you know, your, your style definitely, I showed a picture. We, we were at the hair salon yesterday, me and my wife. Uh -huh. And I, I told our hairstylist, I said, this is my guest tomorrow. She said, wow, what a cool, cool uh, style that you have. So, oh, thank you. Yeah. And then she asked what kind of music you played. So I filled her in too. Okay. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, we're going to be showing some of the pictures from your style and, and music. We're going to be hearing on Mixcloud. But where did you develop that particular style? You know, taking well, chances being, oh, go ahead. I'm originally from Philadelphia, North Philadelphia, and my mom, she loves music. She spends a lot of time going to all the shows back in her day, which was the 60s and the 70s. So when she hung out at the Uptown Theaters and she told me about all the about seeing James Brown, Pete Funk, all the great at the Uptown Theater, Earth, Wind and & Fire, and I felt like I was listening to her stories and all those stories she told me she had their music in her album collection. So I was constantly listening to those albums and I believe that's what molded my sound. So you had some great music playing in the house, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. same yeah, too, yes. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, obviously yeah, we're gonna go on to the guitar playing. Um, the Ghetto Songbird, G give us the origin of the nickname and the stage name Ghetto Songbird. Ghetto Songbird was actually my email address back oh, in okay. the late 90s. And okay. I noticed when I would use it, people would start calling me that. And at the time, I didn't have a stage name. So it made me think about this songbird who would always sing on my ledge in North Philadelphia. So wow. I wanted to kind of pay homage to that beautiful things do come out of the ghetto. That's right. You're, you're living proof, right? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So North Philly, I we were talking before I went on air. I, I was in Philadelphia living 1985 to 87. And I, I've made some trips for concerts uh, in the meantime after that. But ha has North Philly changed any a bit? Oh, yes. Okay. Temple University, they're, they board up all the space. So the North Philly I knew growing up is no longer that. It's more of a um, campus now. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I remember taking the subway up there, yeah. um, Broad Street, getting off. Yeah. I still root for my Temple Owls in basketball, <laughs> <laughs> so, even though they're not doing too well this year. I know. Yeah. So you're getting into the guitar. That's, you know, you've got a great style playing guitar mm -hmm. and all different kinds of flavors to your music. Picking up the guitar, was that your first instrument and what drew you to the guitar? My first instrument was the keyboard at the age of 12. My mom heard me playing around on a little tiny keyboard and she noticed that I was picking up the music I was listening to on the radio. So she bought me a keyboard. So then I started writing songs mainly on the keyboard. And I had a guitar player that was in another band called Wicked Bliss and he would play for me. So one day he told me I can no longer play for you because I'm starting my own band. And I was like, well, I have all these gigs lined up. So I found I found somebody to help me through that time as far as finishing those gigs. But I said that will never happen to me again. So I went <laughs> to a pawn shop and I brought right. my guitar. And got your first guitar, right? Yeah. yeah. What kind of uh, guitars do you play right now? I play a vintage guitar that is made in the um, image of the SG guitar. It looks like the guitar sister Rosetta Tharp played. Oh, but okay. yeah. That all about my BC riches, but my husband bought me the one that looks like the SG. So that's my baby now. Yeah. Yeah. And much love to your husband, right? For, for hooking you up with that. Yeah. He went to Nam and got it for me. Oh, right. Right. Was that the, the recent Nam or the. Uh, that was about four years ago, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Every, I've never been out that way, but it looks great. And all the musicians. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It looks like, looks like heaven. If you're, if you're a musician. Yes. Have money to spend too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
So let's talk about your family. Very important to you and uh, your husband and your kids who are all involved in your music and also your daughter is involved with, uh, I believe, photography and videography. Yeah. Um, first, you and your husband. Where's the start with that and, and getting together with music? We met at a um, club called The Five Spot in Philadelphia. I don't know if you heard of the whole five spot scene where the neo soul music was born. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah music soul child and all those type of artists were down there doing their thing, but we were there as well. I right. was always the one that played rock music while everybody else was doing neo soul. So right. he knew that and he was drawn to me and we started connecting and it led to us dating and you know, the rest is history. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And still together. So that's cool. Years later, we started a band far as to call the Rossploitation Band that will play along with me. And our children would constantly be just like messing around, getting away at rehearsals. So eventually uh -huh. we kind of said, look, if you're going to be here, you got to do something. So they kind of started picking up instruments and playing along with us. But then I would hear them by themselves playing music with their own band and rehearsing their own songs. So the better they, more better they got, especially during the pandemic, right. I knew it was time for them to get on stage with us. Right. And the house sounded loud when you're rehearsing? Yes, very loud. <laughs> and right. thank goodness our neighbors are cool. Yeah, yeah. You got to have good neighbors. Yeah. yeah. I, I used to, you know, for since 1982 and just right before the pandemic, I would DJ parties and I had, you know, all the equipment. I could have blasted out the neighborhood, but, you know, I never plugged it in in the house, but <laughs> I can imagine, you know, but you got to yeah. rehearse. Yes. Yeah, it's you got to rehearse at home because constantly taking gum back and forth to different studios to rehearse becomes too much. So we do it at home. Right. Yeah, yeah. How how about um, music wise, as far as you know, your first music that you got into yourself, and how how about going to see a live show? What would be some of those experiences? Mm -hmm. Music. I was a jazz head first. I love jazz. Sarah Vaughn, Billie Holiday, right. uh, Ella Fitzgerald, and Miles Davis. I love that music, and I feel like that is still in me and in my music because my rock and roll has a different twang to it. It's just not turning on a distortion pedal and playing. It's hills right. and valleys, and I think I got that from listening to diff different types of music. As far as concerts, I used to be like really into going to P-Funk shows all the time. Not the old oh, yeah. funk. I wish I saw them, but I did get to see them before Gary Scheider um, was no longer with us. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know if I told you or you heard on my show. I had Bernie Warrell come to our studios and play uh, with his keyboards. And, you know, he became a great friend, him and his wife, Judy. And yeah. and Gary Scheider, uh, you know, in New Haven, Connect, we saw them at Toad's Place. And Belita Woods, who passed away, yes, um, met, she was there too. Belita was real nice. Yes. Yeah. I met Gary and Belita just by passing them by. Like backstage, oh, okay. Gary, I'm just walking by and he looks at me and says, hey, I'm like, oh, my <laughs> yeah. Belita, I was on the um, P-Funk's bus to meet with Ricky Rouse, the guitar player. Oh, yeah, that's right. I was going to ask you about Ricky. Yeah. yeah. Right. He was a mentor to me and she just happened to be on there and I was like, right. Goodness, because I was not expecting to meet her at that moment. So it was cool. Yeah, we, you know, the times we've seen P Funk, you know, some sometimes the show's a little sloppy at times, but you know, I don't know, maybe they have an off night or some players. But uh Belita Woods, I remember one show, she saved the night. I mean, she kept uh, the whole night that band was gelling and um yeah. yeah. Rest in peace, Belita and Gary. Yes, yes. Yeah. And Star Colors and uh, Elijah Curry. Uh, yeah. Lash Curry, the bass. He's still, I think he's still touring with them. I'm not, yeah, I do believe yeah. he is. Yeah. So, so, anyways, you got great taste in music, which is uh, permeating into your own sound. Yeah. Um, let's let's talk about some of the music. I know you had a mentor on the EP. That let's talk about your EP and where's the best place people can listen to your music and buy your music. Yes, it's unfortunately, I'm more, I wouldn't say unfortunately, but I'm more of a performance artist than a recording artist. Okay, that's cool. But mentor Rosalie Brooks back in 2002, she asked me to come out to LA. And this was before I knew her like that. She just came across me on social media and she asked right. me to come to LA. And I'm like, well, who is this lady? So I look her up. I'm like, oh, she wrote and recorded with Jimi Hendrix. Wow. I was like, yes, I will come. <laughs> <And> <laughs> yeah. For sure, with her. I was like, okay. 
But when I got out there and got to know her, it became beyond Jimi Hendrix. It was more about the connection between us two. And she loved mm -hmm. what I did so much that she wanted to put me in the studio and record that first EP called Ali of the Earth, which is on Bandcamp under Ghetto Songbird. Right. So I will have the links um, displayed here. Okay. Um, our listeners can go there and, and listen to the music and, and keep tabs on Samantha Hollins, a.k.a. the Ghetto Songbird. And mm -hmm. she's joining us right here. We uh, let's talk about some of the performances that are coming up. I know you're playing. Are you playing in Walnut Street somewhere? Um, yes, in Philadelphia, right. 40th Walnut at the Rotunda for Women's Fest. It's 24th Annual Women's Fest. Mm -hmm. I've been playing that for probably five years now, and I love going back, just doing that venue with all those women doing that amazing music. And it's always a great night. That is on March the. We get it wrong. Sunday, March. It's March the third, right? Yeah, yeah. You got it. You got it. <laughs> March the third. Yeah, seven p.m. at the Rotunda in Philadelphia, and, and then we're booking our tour oh, right okay, now. Okay, cool. The gig. The opening gig will be Botswana in May. So we're okay. returning to Botswana. We've returned to a lot of places that we've done in the past to keep it going, because mm -hmm. a lot of times. That, gener that energy that we generate there just continues to get bigger and bigger. So we like to return. Right. So uh, 40th and Walnut, is that near the train station? Actually, it's a hot, hop, skip, and a drum, jump. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Market is like two blocks back from there, Market Street. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I, another thing I wanted to ask you about, because I know you – a few years ago, you organized a festival for several years, right? Yes. What went into that? Tell us about this festival and, and you know, what was going on then? It was called Wingdom Fest, Music and Art Festival. I decided to come up with this festival because when I first started off, it was hard to book gigs. I wasn't rock and roll enough or soulful enough to be on the rock scene or the, the soul scene. So I just mm -hmm. decided to create my own scene. It started off with the open mic that I used to do with another sister by the name of Faith. And then I went into doing this festival that would invite other artists that had the same issues that I had getting booked. Right. So it was uh, definitely rewarding for you as far as, hey, we lost you right there. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. It wasn't intentional. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was definitely rewarding, and and you mentioned some of the stuff that you're you're, you know, you're playing music that doesn't fit into certain avenues, you know, yeah. you know, quote unquote. Um, as far as radio, I, I remember when I was in Philly, um, I listened to DAS and yeah. Kiss FM. They yeah. were there, and um, Temple had a decent. Was it RTI? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So so as far as um, the stations. You growing up then, what, what did you listen to? Or did you listen to radio? I listened to them all. Okay. I remember listening to um, WDS, Power 99 FM. It was Q102, KISS, WMMR. I was all over the stations because I love yeah. every genre, really. I love every genre. Yeah, we, we've we been to Philly a lot of times to see Prince, um, the Purple Rain Tour. Mm -hmm. I remember driving. I wasn't living in Philly, but it was... Thanksgiving weekend, 1984, we drove in, and it, the best feeling was turning the radio in yeah. the car. You'd hear, you know, song by song, everybody was playing Prince. My and mom we started, went to that show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I probably was in the same house because yeah. I was two nights, and then I saw Prince at the Electric Factory. Larry Graham was there, hmm. and um, the last time I saw Prince. I always forget the name of the venue. It was right in the neighborhood I used to live, uh, right on Broad Street. It's like the uh, classical orchestra plays there, Broad oh. Street. Oh, it was there? Yeah, yeah. It was um really nice theater. Najee was playing in his band. Oh, wow. Um, I missed that one. Yeah, it was right on Broad Street, right around a little south of Market, Walnut. Oh, wow. Um, but anyways, the funny thing is when Prince was, we were waiting to get, led into the venue and i looked to my right outside broad street i'm seeing prince run from his hotel across the street sprinting a mad dash into the theater in high heels running right past everybody was wow like, that was prince <laughs> wow <laughs> yeah so it was good i got great memories with philadelphia so yes yeah, yeah philly Not, had a lot of great shows back then yeah yeah talk about the neo soul scene because um we one of our good friends he passed away was jeff lee johnson 
Mm, I don't know yeah. if you ran into Jeff, but um, ironically, I ran into him at a photo shoot one time. They had a whole bunch of Philly musicians come down for this huge photo shoot that was supposed to mimic the Harlem Renaissance, and he oh, was yeah, there. Oh yeah, and yeah, he had yeah. This amazing—I don't know if it was fur, but it was like fringy type of shirt. I mean, jacket. And he had his guitar, and I'm like, I know who that is. And I wish that at that moment I would have approached him because right. he was no longer here after that. Yeah, yeah. If I if I I I knew him really well. I, he came to our show. He drove from down from Philly and and jammed with a trio two different times in the studio. Wow. Um, I don't know if you ran into Ted Thomas, the drummer. No. He he, pa he passed away through mm -hmm. uh, with COVID, but um, yeah, Jeff was something. I mean, he. He didn't fit in the mix, yeah. you know, but he, you know, he, a lot of people say phenomenal guitarist, one of the best yeah, ever. I think even Prince's drummer, Michael Bland, said that Prince thought he was the best guitarist. So Whoa. Jeff Lee Johnson. Yeah. Wow, that's deep. Yeah. So maybe we'll all get to see him again in the other world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now your husband, tell us about specifically who plays what in the band hmm. um, and how do you guys round it out and also give it a little spotlight on, on your daughter who helps with the great photography. My husband, Ronan Ali, he is our drummer and percussionist. Then we have my best friend, Chris Nelson, who's our keyboard player. Okay. And then my oldest son, Clave Hollins, he joined the band. So he's our second keyboard player. My youngest, well, the middle child son, Jim Bay Hollins, he plays drums and percussion. He's more so on djembe, playing the djembe, but sometimes okay. he jumps on the drums as well. And then Ikembe Hollins, he plays hand percussion, and he's like a little hype guy dancing on the stage. <laughs> and he's six years old, so right, right. he's still growing into his space. My daughter, Lilo Hollins, she does all the videography and photos at this point. So when we're on stage performing, she makes sure she captures it all. So everybody's got to play a part in the band. Anybody who, yeah. who's reluctant to, to get involved in the family? Lilo was. She oh, okay. was on stage with us because she's also a dancer. So I wanted okay. to get on the dance and sing, but she found her way behind the camera. I said, well, that works too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a nice concept and, and great to work with, with yeah. family, of course. But you're yeah. the band leader, I assume. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, our audience should know that you also host a radio show out in Delaware. Yeah. And uh, let's talk about your, your broadcasting career. My broadcasting career started in 1996, I believe. Okay. I took radio at the Art Institute of Philadelphia, and I loved it. And I right. always wanted to do it, but never did it. Right, so right. About, two, about a year and a half ago, a woman by the name of Janice King, who was hosting the Wilmington Renaissance radio show in Wilmington, Delaware, was ready to retire from the show and said, I want you to take over. I'm like, how did she know? I never mentioned that I wanted to do that. But right. somehow it came to me and I said, this time I'm going to go with it. And I love it. It's on Saturdays, 3 through 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on right. WHGE 95.3 FM. So people can listen online as well? Yes, it's streaming on WHGE953.com. Okay. So it's mostly music or interviews and it's up. mostly interviews and live in studio performances. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I love that when up until 2020, no, 20, yeah, 2020, the pandemic, I, I worked at WVOF and yeah. uh, we would bring bands in the studio and we had a stage outside for a few of the shows. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Musicians love it. <laughs> I know. I love doing that too. Yeah. So it's uh, cool to be able provide that to other artists now right right the only thing i found i've told other musicians the drummer has a tough spot especially if they're used to playing a full-on kit because yeah you know they if i always had to tell them you got to play like you're having brushes in your hands exactly yes. right right so so some of the artists that you aspire you know if any artists out there working with who would you love to maybe write a song with or, or collaborate mm. with there's a band that the band that invited us to Botswana, they're heavy metal, like really <laughs> metal. Right. Yeah. I would love to find a way somewhere in between that we can work together, bring my sound and their sound together and do a song. Mm -hmm. And they're called Overthrust. Okay. That's gonna happen. You, you know, you're gonna be out there again, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
They don't know well, that. So this will be the first time they hear this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> you're putting them on the spot. Yes. <laughs> now you, you've played a lot of great venues. I, I know one of the places we used to go all the time down in uh, Greenwich village, um, the bitter end. Yes. We played the bitter end and, and that, that club is always amazing. I mean, the, the, the decor is not so great. I mean, the bathrooms are disgusting. <laughs> At least I thought back then. But the stage and the musicianship and the history of that that place is phenomenal. So how, how did you get involved with The Bitter End? When I first started out, I met up with a man by the name of Larry. I can't remember his last name, but Larry. In mm -hmm. um, New York, he had auditions for up-and-coming artists to play at places like the Bitter End and CBGB. So I auditioned right. and I got in. It became like a every month thing, going to either CBGBs, the Bitter End, and it was the Elbow Room. And oh, yeah, the Elbow Room. We yeah. would have shows there. So years yeah. later, I got with my band. I was like, oh, I have to take my band there. So we just go back every now and again just to touch that base because it's something about that history that gets inside of you when you perform there. And me loving Donnie Hathaway, every time I'm on that stage where he right. recorded his album, it's like, whoa. And Richie Havens played there. Come on. Yeah. I yeah. met R Richie Havens, believe it or not, at a Belmont racetrack in, out in New York. He was there. It was the Belmont Stakes. He was there. So, yeah, great, great artist. Yes, I met and, him. And yeah. World Cafe Live in Philadelphia. Oh, okay, right. Man, I, I felt like I would never want to wash my hand after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely influential through through music yeah. and, and what he had to say. So yes. Now now the bitter end, what is the standard time frame they give you to you and your band to play on stage? How long can you play? Oh, uh, it depends. Sometimes it, at the, my earlier days it was like 15 minutes, okay. but sometimes it's from a half an hour to 45 minutes. Right. Yeah. yeah, the guy, I think he may have passed away. The guy was outside Kenny. Mm. I don't know if you ran into him, but he he was he wanted us to actually simulcast our radio show there oh, um, in New York. Nice. We never got around to it, but we had talked about it. every time I see him, he says, you just come in, record whatever you want. I know, you know, they, they were really open to a lot of stuff. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So the yeah. World Cafe, yeah. I've never been there, but I, you know, Victor Wooten, all the players, Derek Trucks and all that. I know they've yeah. done stuff, Jeff Coffin through yeah. World Cafe. What kind of place is World Cafe? World Cafe is a bigger vibe. It's like the sound just like bouncing all over the place. <laughs> And the energy is exciting because you have so much space. Because I'm a performer. I'm the type of performer that I utilize the whole stage. Right. So I have space and room. And it scares me when the cords are tied behind my legs and everything. Because I wear my heels and I'm dancing and I can't move. So right, I love right. like the World Cafe Live because it gives you a lot of space to move. Mm -hmm. And the sound is bouncing all over the room. And the energy of the people is always very lively. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of artist that I love to see, you know, entertaining right. and uh, standing in one place and just being, singing the song. And it, it doesn't move me as much as, mm -hmm. you know, someone like yourself and others that, that really grip with the crowd, you know. It all started with Purple Rain for me. Yeah, back, yeah, yeah. Back then, I didn't know I wanted well, What movie is that? No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Speaking of Prince, um, what what kind of stuff did you like? I mean, you probably like all this stuff, but what what really got you to be a lover of Prince's music? It was Purple Rain. Okay, I was I was um a child when that came out, so it was all about Purple Rain for me. Like I said, my mother went to the concert and she had the album and she was watching the movie over and over again. I don't know if you remember those big discs they used to have. Oh yeah, yeah. The uh, we had that. <laughs> Every day I'm watching, every day. And back then I never had a thought of being an artist or playing guitar or anything. But when I finally put that guitar in my hand, I visualized myself on that stage. I was like, it has to be as big as Prince. Otherwise it's pointless. He was having so much fun and I want to have that type of fun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he was music and just you yeah. know, all sorts of styles, guitar and finally being recognized for a lot of the stuff that people yeah. just kind of maybe... Didn't get, I had even had someone he I mean he's early 20 mid 20s and he says I didn't I didn't know Prince played the guitar so mm -hmm. but but no he it was the he was watching the MTV uh when he played Webster Hall he did the yeah. acoustic thing for the uh 
you know, the musicology thing. Yeah. And we totally. actually we were there at Webster Hall and me and my wow. wife in the studio. And that that was great. And I, we haven't seen there were additional songs he did that weren't aired. And hopefully one day the, yeah. they're gonna uh show those. So oh I hope so. There's a lot of stuff, you know, Prince with the vaults and concerts and everything. Yeah. He's even got a few of my uh radio shows in his vault. He requested them. Wow. Yeah, I had to send him FedEx up to Paisley Park, and um, yeah, so wow. wonder where they are. They're probably preserved, hopefully. Yeah, one day they're gonna come out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for, for for a few people will buy them. <laughs> another another club because I saw some stuff. There's if you just uh, go on YouTube, Samantha Hollins, the Ghetto Songbird, you could see some of the performance at uh, Whiskey a Go Go in L.A. What how, what brought you out to L.A. Whiskey a go go. I was watching the Doors movie with my mom one year. Okay. And I like after seeing that movie, I said, I want to play at the Whiskey a Go Go. So yeah. I called the Whiskey a Go Go and they booked me in my van. And next thing that I know, we were out there. It was wow. that cool. So so what's what's the club scene for music out there? I've never been to California, just seen it. Um, is it different from the East Coast? Yes, because like when I okay, let's say for instance in Philadelphia, if I do a show on a work night, there's not right. going to be a lot of people coming. Right, but if I right. do a show on a work night in LA, it'll still be packed. Yeah, well that that's that's a big difference. <laughs> I've never done a show on a weekend in LA. It's always been during the week. Right, and people were still there. Yes. Yeah. So I can yeah, only the same weekends like. Was that? I can only imagine what the weekends like. Yeah, yeah. One of our favorite bands is uh slapback jerry harris okay he's that band and uh they're they're from orange county la and I, I saw some streaming from from this club they play at skyloft out in laguna beach and mm -hmm. yeah people are just going bananas about music out there wow yeah but hey it's never too late to get things going here on the east coast oh yeah and you're out you're out in Del what brought you out to delaware because you're out there now right delaware is peace oh, i want to okay. be Go home to peace and quiet, and right. then the riot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes, but but it's a different lifestyle than than uh, Philadelphia, I'm sure. Oh yes, it was a culture shock for me because I'm used to hearing cars, horns, and everything through the middle of the night. Yeah, it's peace and quiet. You hear the and the squirrels, and you hear the bugs or whatever. That's what you right. hear. <laughs> how how long does it take you to get back into Philly? It's really not long. I would say about a half an hour, depending on traffic. Okay. Well, you go by, you go cross to Ben Franklin. Is that it? Um, you could. Good. Yeah. Okay. So let, let's refresh our, our listeners and viewers out there about some upcoming performances. I know people may be watching this because it's going to be up there for eternity, this interview. Mm -hmm. And um, But upcoming, if they watch it, what, what's going to, the tour is coming up. Tell us about what's going on. Well, our spot dates start with um, the Rotunda Women's Fest, 24th Annual Women's Fest at the Rotunda in Philadelphia on Sunday, March the 3rd. Mm -hmm. Then that following week, March the 8th, I'm performing at an international women's event, which is, I believe, a private event. Okay. But after that, we'll start gearing towards the actual tour. And the first date we have for the tour right now is Botswana. And we're doing a fundraiser. We always do a fundraiser for this because it's a community give back type of festival they do in Botswana. So we go there to not only perform, but we go there to exchange culture and mm -hmm. to basically journal, do journalism and try to learn more about. So when we come back here, we can educate others about the culture there. Oh, and I didn't touch on, on your writing that, that you've yeah. been doing all these years. Tell, tell us about um, your writing and your passion for that. Every People probably don't know this, but writing has always been my first love and the thing that I love the most. Mm -hmm. Ghetto Songbird, rocking on a guitar and singing is only because I love writing. Okay. I'm a writer. I've been a published writer. I've had my work in books, magazines, and now I have my own site called thecoacherockgrill.com. Okay. Well, we'll put that link in as well. Yes. Yeah. Are you working on anything specific right now or just letting things I have, flow? I have like three books in my mind. I have to Okay. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I you know, I I, I did work as a 
I lived in Taipei, Taiwan for three years and I worked as a editor, proofreader at a publishing company. Mm -hmm. And it's funny writing, um, the people in Taiwan, you know, Asian, primarily Asians at the company, but I was the American, you know, in prim the native speaker yeah. for the company. And they would ask me grammar questions. And for the life of me, I could not explain intelligently <laughs> writing gram gra grammar and everything like that. I would just say, oh, you got to write like this. But mm -hmm. but they would know grammar better than I did. So, wow. Yeah. But we were just doing English textbooks, probably some boring stuff. <laughs> yeah. But listen, we um, also about the music. I know you you uh, perform, and that that's the main thing going on right now. But people want to listen to your music and watch some of the videos. Where are the best place that people can check out Ghetto Songbird Samantha Hollins? I am on YouTube under Ghetto Songbird. All you got to do is Google me as well. Ghetto Songbird and everything will pop up. Also right. on Bandcamp under Ghetto Songbird. And if you want to follow me to learn more about me, my everyday life, I'm on Instagram under Ghetto Songbird and I'm on Facebook. Right. Songbird. You got to stay on top of all this stuff. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's draining. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But hey, there's a lot of great people out there and uh, hopefully people are open to more. Yes. styles of music and, and blend of music than what they're hearing on the radio. Yes, I Standard know. I, radio. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, hey, listen, Samantha, Ghetto Songbird, I want to thank you for coming on and, and it's just an honor to have you on. And, and thanks, you know, thank from the you. heart from being a supporter of our show and what we've done over the years. So oh, much respect. We'll, we'll definitely continue. Yeah, we'll continue to give you love and respect as well. I appreciate it. Thank you so yeah. much. And next time you got to bring the family on. Yes. We'll, we'll get about uh, five different TV screens and okay. rotate the family in for the interview. Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everyone. Samantha Hollins, Ghetto Songbird, great, great artist, writer. She does it all. <laughs> this is uh, Samantha. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care.